Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today is a very special Sunday. It's Missions Sunday. And today we're going to learn more about missions, about missionaries, and sharing the gospel. But before we go any further, we need to talk about what the gospel is. The gospel means good news. It's the good news about Jesus. But what does that mean? We know it's good. It's actually amazing. We'll see just now. We know it's news, so it's true. It actually happened. And we know that it's about Jesus. But what does the gospel truly mean? Well, the gospel is something that happened one day, nearly 2,000 years ago, but it is also the story of the entire Bible. It's God's great rescue plan, and he planned it since before the world existed. The gospel starts at the very beginning when God made everything. God spoke, and he made the world and everything in it, including people. And because God made everything, he is in charge of everything. God made people to be in a relationship with him, to live close to him. And in the very beginning, everything was perfect. But the first two people that God made, Adam and Eve, disobeyed God. We call this sin. And since Adam and Eve sinned against God, everyone has sinned. Because God is holy, our sin separates us from God. And God must also punish sin. The punishment for our sin is death. Death meaning our bodies will die one day. But it also means that we will live separated, far away from God forever. But remember how we said that the gospel is God's rescue plan and that he had this plan even before the world was made. Well, God always had a plan to rescue people from their sin and to bring them close to him again. God sent his only son, Jesus, to take the punishment that we deserve for our sin. Jesus never sinned, but he died on the cross in our place. He gave his life so that we might live with God. And what's more amazing is that Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose on the third day and he is alive in heaven. And now anyone who trusts in Jesus can be rescued from their sin. When we trust Jesus and follow him, God forgives us from our sin and we get Jesus' righteousness. So that means that God sees us as if we are perfect like Jesus. And God promises that we will live close to him forever, even after our bodies have died. And this is why the good news is so truly amazing. And this news isn't just for today. This news is for our forever future. One day, Jesus will return to finally fix everything in the world that has been broken by sin. And when he returns, he will punish those who haven't been rescued by him forever. But those who have trusted in him and been rescued, they will live with Jesus forever and ever where there is no sin, no death, no sadness, no tears and no pain. This good news is for the whole world. It's for everyone. It's for you and it's for me. God doesn't make us follow Jesus, but he invites us to. Just like Adam and Eve in the very beginning had a choice to make, we also have to choose. We can choose to carry on sinning and turning away from God, or we can choose to turn away from our sin, to turn to Jesus, to trust in him, and to follow him as our rescuer and our king. Last week, we learned about the word righteousness, which is to be in a right relationship with God. And that is only possible by trusting Jesus. In a right relationship with God, we are truly changed by the good news of Jesus rescuing us. So we are not ashamed to share the gospel. Our memory verse this week tells us that God wants his people to tell others about what Jesus has done for them. 
So now we have a really special family from Ukraine to share this memory verse with us. And then we will also listen to our memory verse in Zulu and in Afrikaans. And that is to remind us that God wants people of all nations and all languages to know the gospel. Good morning, everybody. We are the Nigeria family, and we are so glad to be here with you this morning. This morning, we're going to do the memory verse together, and it comes from Matthew 28, verse 19. Are you ready? Let's do it together. Go, Go therefore, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This morning, Misha and Carla also have a big surprise for you guys. They're going to do the same verse, but in Russian. Listen carefully. Matveya 28, 19. Поэтому пойдите ко всем народам и сделайте их моими учениками. Крестите их во имя Отца, Сына и Святого Духа. It was really nice seeing you guys and spending this little time together. Keep practicing your verse. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Hello guys, today I'm going to do a memory verse in my home language, Isizulu. Umateu, chapter 28, verse 19. Ngakoke, hambani, nienze izizwe zonke, abafundi. Niba papatise, ngekama, loise, elendotana, nomoya oinwele. So here's the memory verse in Afrikaans. Matthias, 28, vers 19. Gaan dan en maak disciples van alle nasies. Doop hulle in die naam van die Vader en die Seen en die Heilige Gees. Thank you for sharing the memory verse in these four different languages. And what this hopefully reminds us is that we don't need to travel to another country to share the gospel, but we can share it in our own language, within our own family or neighborhood. And so next up, we have Isabella and Rosie, and they will be unpacking the Great Commission. And why is it great? Rosie is my puppet pal. Her hair is straight and yellow. I'm white and dreams and twinkle hue. And we both say hello. Hello and welcome to another episode of Bible stories with Isabella Jane and Rosie. You know, Della, I love learning about all these stories. Do you really? Yeah, I, I do. So what are we learning about today? Well, Rosie, I thought today we would talk about what our mission is. Our mission? Yes, our mission. We have a mission? Rosie, everyone has a mission. I do? Yes. Oh, Rosie, so when someone becomes a doctor, what's their mission? To help people. When someone becomes a teacher, what's their mission? To teach people. When someone becomes a Christian, what's their mission? To Christian people. Kind of. Very similar. Our mission as Christians is to spread the gospel, the good news of Christ, to help grow the kingdom of God. Well, and grow internally in our own walks and our own lives with Jesus. Rosie, you've already got it. But Bella, yes. How do we know that our mission as Christians is to Christian people? It's not Christian people. Same thing. Okay. What well, we know this, Rosie, because it's everywhere in our Bible. It is? Rosie, even in the Old Testament, the stories that we were telling were all about growing the kingdom of God, spreading the gospel. I think you're right. No, you know I'm right. Mm, you're right, Stella. But, but now it's different in the New Testament. Well, why do you say that? Well, because in the New Testament, we have the good news of Jesus. 
That's exactly right. So now, how do we know that it's our mission as Christians to Christian people? Well, there's many stories in the New Testament, but I thought we'd look at one particular man. Well, who? Saul. Saul? Well, he was a bad guy. Yeah, Saul wasn't a very good guy. He, in fact, was against Christianity. He was so zealous about what they did believe and completely disregarded this new movement, this new religion with Christ. Oh, well, then he's one of the good examples. Well, I think he is. You see, he led a lot of the persecution against Christians. Well, that's not good. No, it's not. But we can see that, as our example, we have an extreme. Yeah, he didn't like us at all. Exactly. But then one day, he met Jesus. Yeah. And Jesus spoke to him, and then he suddenly realized he's been doing the wrong thing this whole time. So he became a Christian? Exactly. Now, remember, Rosalie said, when you become a Christian, What's your mission? To Christian people. <laughs> so what do you think Paul then did? He then helped spread the gospel, didn't he? Well, Rosie, he becomes one of the most famous men in the Bible for what he did, for, for everything he did for Christianity. Okay, well, how do we know? Well, he had one big change. You see, when he met Jesus and he became a Christian, he said, everything that I have gained is is loss for Christ. Well, what does that mean? Well, Rosie, I think he realized that all of these accomplishments, these big things he was doing against Christianity were good for him, but they weren't good for Christ. Then he realized if it's not good for Christ, it wasn't good for him either. So he really changed. So as extreme as he was against Christianity, he became extreme for Christianity, and we see this throughout his whole walk in the Bible and the stories that we have. So Paul was really like a big figure in changing the course of Christianity. No, Jesus was the big figure who changed Christianity, and Paul believed it, and he wanted to help spread the gospel. Well, I think that's amazing, Della. So he did some amazing things, didn't he? Rosie, he did some incredible things. He went to places where, where people hadn't heard the, the gospel before. He said where people haven't heard, they will hear. And when people haven't seen, they will see. And did they? Well, Rosie, because he loved God so much and God was working through him, yeah, Rosie, they did. There were many, many people who were touched by Paul and what he had to say about Christ and God and how he was spreading the gospel and growing the kingdom. And I'm sure that he was becoming a better man every day because he dedicated his life to all of this. <laughs> That's exactly right, Rosie. You see, he ended up being a prisoner on a ship. He was going to churches where they were completely like on the wrong track and putting himself in dangerous situations. Bella, Paul did all these amazing and big things and, and he was really on mission. Um, it kind of makes me feel a little bit insignificant. Well, why? Oh, if we have to be on mission, and if someone like Paul is the example, well, then I'm not doing a very good job because I'm just here. Rosie. Yeah. If you were a prisoner on a ship wanting to make your appeal to Caesar, like Paul was, for example. Yeah. Then you wouldn't be sitting here today telling the story and also helping spread the gospel. So, so what you're saying is this is my mission. Rosie, remember in most of our stories we've said God puts us in certain places for a reason? Yeah. Our life is our mission. The way we live is our mission. Okay. So some people's mission is to go to, to, to places where Christianity is persecuted and it's dangerous, and that's their mission. Okay, 
that doesn't mean that your mission isn't important. Well, well, I guess if we were all doing the dangerous stuff, then no one would be doing the other stuff. Exactly, because Rosie, everything that we do in life is part of the mission. And we have all these different roles because we need to reach more people. Well, I think I understand now. Because if we were all flocking one place, then, then, then we would all be there and no one would be here. Or no one would be there wherever you're watching this from. Exactly. So Rosie, in I think what we've learned from today is our life as a Christian is our mission. And wherever we are, that's where we should grow the kingdom of God and straight the gospel. You are the way, the truth and the life. We live by faith and not by sight for you. So thank you, Isabella and Rosie. We learned that Jesus died, that we might see and believe. And we can ask God to help us in the Great Commission to share the good news with others. But how is this possible? God can use us as a microphone where he does the speaking and we are the instruments that spread his sound. In spreading the good news to others, we, didn't, we do not earn God's favor or love. But because we were rescued by Jesus, we have been changed. And so we want to share the gospel. We cannot share the good news through our own strength or ability, but we can expect God to work through us and bring people to know him as their rescuer. So next up is our worship song and a really fun interview with one of our newest missionaries, Christine. So our worship song reminds us that we can be fishers of men for Jesus. Jesus calls us to follow him and be a part of God's special family. By accepting Jesus' invitation to follow him, he can use us as microphones to share the good news. So we can help others to learn about Jesus when we follow his example with others around us. As Jesus was walking beside the sea, the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were. They were fishermen. And I will make you fishers of men. Come, follow me, Jesus said. And I will make you fishers of men. As Jesus was walking beside the sea, the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were, they were fishermen. I will make you 
fishers of men. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Yeah, fishers of men. The dead ones, they left their nets and followed him. Yeah, they followed him. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. And I will make you fishers of men. Yeah, come follow me, Jesus said. And I will make you fishers of men. Come follow me, Jesus said. And I will make you fishers of men. Yeah, come follow me, Jesus said. And I will make Fishers of men, come follow me. Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. Yeah, come follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Come follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us on our Missions Sunday. And instead of doing a talk this week, we are doing an interview with a very special guest. And it is... Ohayo gozaimasu, watashi no nomai wa kudustine des. And that means, good morning, my name is Christine. Welcome, Christine. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, so I'm sure you guys know Christine from Holiday Club and from just being around RUC. Christine, can you just start off by telling us a fun fact about yourself? Absolutely. Um, I have very interesting pets, as most of you know, Gaston and Rosie. Gaston is a pink baby corn snake and Rosie is a 15-year-old Chilean rose tarantula. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing, Christine. I have two dogs, so you are far more interesting than me. <laughs> so before we chat more about your experience um, in Japan, let's talk a little bit about missions. And so my question to you, Christine, is what do we mean by the word missions? Absolutely. Uh, now, Candice, the interesting thing is before we can really understand what missions is, we need to first understand what mission is. Now, there is a difference, even if it's slightly. Now, theologians, people who study the Bible or biblical things, suggest that mission, without the S, refers to a total biblical assignment of the Church of Jesus Christ, which basically includes the upward, inward, and outward ministry and work of everyone of the Church. Okay? Now, missions with an S, on the other hand, is, as we can see this in the life of Paul in the Bible, Many say that they have three elements. This is going out of the area where your church was first established, so the element of going, and first establishing or evangelizing the unreached, then equipping those disciples, and then also establishing local church. So it's the building of churches, evangelizing the outreach, and equipping disciples as you go out. When we're talking about missions and, and missionaries, people that go out, why would someone want to go out and leave their home and their families behind? Why do you become a missionary? You know, Candice, it's a very hard thing to do, uh, for me at least. And I believe that the most important thing in this life is to advance God's kingdom. 
So even though we love our families deeply, God called them or us, missionaries, I suppose, and, and helped them to understand the need to reach those who have not heard about Jesus. Now, usually these uh, places do not have enough believers to go out and spread the good news themselves. So missionaries uh, realize this and go out of their comfort zone, leaving their home and family behind in order to reach the lost and to teach these people about Jesus Christ and his good news. So the ultimate goal is worth giving up your family. And so based on this ultimate goal of, of sharing the good news, why should we share it? We, we should share it because it's the most important thing in this world. It's, it doesn't, it's not just about having hope in the world life to come, but it's also having hope now. Knowing what Jesus had done for us on the cross, this good news is more important than anything else that we live for. So this more this most important like task that you saying that we should do, is there any examples? Who's been the greatest example of doing this? Yeah, you know, um, we see many incredible examples in the Bible, like the disciples or even Paul. But the greatest example is Jesus himself, actually. He lived a perfect life. He reached out to so many different people, gave up everything and traveled to far places to tell people about God. Uh, he demonstrated what it means to love God and to love others, so much so that he even died for us. Sure. Jesus is just incredible. And uh, earlier, um, Christine, you mentioned that you want to follow Jesus' example uh, by being a missionary in Japan. And so I want to know, why do you want to go to Japan? Why Japan? You know, I get this question a lot, um, and it helps me think about my motives. And because God revealed this to me, how great the need is in Japan. Like when he did that, it absolutely broke my heart. I knew that I had to go back and I had to do what I can to help. I mean, there's only a handful of Christians and they need to reach 127 million people. That's a lot. And this is a massive task to accomplish alone. Now, they need more workers to help and share the good news, disciple, plant churches, bring hope to a hopeless society. And most of these people don't know who Jesus are. Like all these elements together, that is why I want to go. That is so encouraging, Christine. And I know just from being your friend that you went to Japan um, to visit some friends and see what it would be like to live there. Um, so can you share with us what was your favorite thing about Japan? Uh, yes, and it may start off a little bit strange, but the interesting thing about Japan is that uh, this island of Japan gets many, many natural disasters. Okay. Now, just to give you an idea, they have 110 active volcanoes. 47 of them are being closely watched because of how active they are. They get around 1,500 earthquakes every year. Tsunamis, floods, landslides, all these things often destroy many parts of Japan. Yet, despite that, the Japanese have survived. They have a determination that is absolutely insane. This allows them to live in one of the riskiest places for natural disasters in the world. Now this falls into everything they do. It's absolutely amazing. They are resilient, they're extremely hardworking, and no matter what happens, they adapt and overcome every time. Uh, Candice, tell, I'm telling you, you would have to see this for yourself. They have an incredible sense of quality, ethics, and service. Sure. In essence, yeah. I suppose, the hardworking, attention to detail, and determined attitude of the Japanese people, that's my favorite thing. <laughs> it sounds like such an incredible group of people, and you're really getting me excited. I, I wish we weren't in lockdown so I could travel um, there with you. Friends, what have been huge cultural differences or, or, or barriers that you've had to overcome while being in Japan? Candice, I think I gave the Japanese a big shock <laughs> because the Japanese are very soft-spoken people and I had to continuously lower my voice all the time. I had to be constantly cautious about that. They also don't like eye contact very much. 
and feel it's rude or inappropriate to keep eye contact when speaking to someone. So I never knew where to look at all. It was the most awkward thing. <laughs> you know, because they are very efficient, so long before you even get to the ticket gate, you have to have your ticket out and ready to swipe the moment you get there so you don't inconvenience others or slow down the line. Unfortunately, I slowed down the line many times because I just wasn't fast enough. And you could see the frustration on people's faces, even though they wouldn't say it. You always have to keep to the left, no matter where you are, to ensure smooth flow of traffic. So I ended up often right there blocking people or in, up in people's way because you don't always realize that you have to be left with everything you do, even in the grocery aisle. And, and one more thing is that they do one thing at a time. So it's socially unacceptable to walk and eat and or even drink. Even ice cream. They put up signs for foreigners to read and see, please don't eat your ice cream in front of other people's shops or please don't walk and eat even ice cream. It's really, really strange. Um, and you almost feel frustrated by that, but it's definitely something that you need to always be conscious of. That's so tough. I can't imagine how hard that must be because it's so nice to have like your cup of coffee and walking around the like the streets. Now you can't do that. That's so yeah. crazy. Um, so what has been the big like adjustment or challenge that you've had to face? You know, it's it's not being able to understand or read anything. My basic Japanese was not nearly good enough to help me out when I was lost or when I needed anything other than a bathroom or asking, can I have this and can I have that, please? <laughs> so that was very, very difficult. You don't realize how much of a barrier is between you and people if the language in itself is an obstacle. Another thing was remembering not to touch people. <laughs> um, the Japanese bow when they greet. And I myself am not a touchy feely person, but one week in, I needed a hug from someone <laughs> because they don't even do that. Christine, just based off what you said about having like a uh, learning a new language and that perhaps being a challenge, um, can you tell us a little bit about your friends and how you connected with them? How were you able to share about who Jesus is and what he has done for them in perhaps a totally different language or in broken English. How did you share that with them? It, it is very difficult. So most of my, when I spoke, I spoke to people who had a little bit of sense of English um, or there was a Japanese translator with me. So it is very difficult to communicate anything. And because the Japanese don't share how they feel, they would agree with you whether they believe in it or not. So most of the Japanese I befriended were not Christian, and they came to Bible studies either because they wanted to learn English or simply because they had to be polite and they couldn't decline when invited. So they agree with whatever you say, whether they agree with it or not. And this is just the Japanese way. So knowing, even though they know that Christianity is based on Christ. They don't understand the concept of who he is and what he has done. Now, interestingly enough, some of these people who's attended the Bible study for years to come, or for like seven or 12 or 14 years, they may feel a little bit more open or willing to be honest about their thoughts. So the interesting thing about what they shared was that the gospel is a great idea, they say, but it, it's nice to live by, but it's for a foreigner. It's, it's not for the Japanese. And, and this is because it's so countercultural. And most Japanese even consider Christianity or other religions that's not native to Japan, like Shintoism or Buddhism, to be a dangerous cult. And they shun the believers completely if they want to accept this faith. So even if, even if some people want to accept Christ, they don't just because it's not Japanese. So this is a major obstacle. Most even feel they shared that it's arrogant to claim that Christ is the only way to God or that there's no way of making up for the stuff that you've done wrong. Now, and this is all because the concept of being a sinner is foreign to the Japanese people. They do not have the word for it like we do. They would, they, the word they would use for sinner is criminal 
And many are even offended for you to even suggest that they are sinners because you're basically telling them that they're criminals and they really insist that they are. So that's been the biggest obstacle to overcome. But there has been a handful of Japanese Christians who have come across, who I have come across, and, and they understood the gospel on a heart level. And this was so beautiful. And the way they understand it is a little bit different to ours. And so they understand that God created us to be in a relationship with him and that our shame and disobedience separated us from him. They also understand that Jesus is the son of God who through grace took up their shame on himself, paying the full price for it on their behalf. Now, they also understand that because of this, they can now pursue a relationship with God as they can come into his presence unashamed and blameless. So the wording is quite different. But at the end of the day, the truth remains the same. Sure. That is so encouraging. Thank you so much, Christine, for sharing. I have just one more question before we get into how we can share the gospel in light of this pandemic. So my final question is, what has God been teaching you about himself as you get ready to take on this huge, uh, like, great commission, this call to share the gospel in the uncertainty uh, of this, like the pandemic, but then also in the challenge that um, in Japan, their view and understanding of God and, and sin and shame is so different to the way that we see it. You know, Candice, God is teaching me that I have a lot to learn. I definitely don't have all the words perfectly figured out. I need to learn how to be more sensitive towards the Japanese culture and that it's so countercultural to mine that I have to start at the bottom again. He's teaching me that this pandemic is not too big for him to handle and that he can even use this time to glorify himself. And I need to keep on following him no matter what, no matter where he leads, and no matter how hectic the storm may be around us. Now, even at a time like this, where tomorrow is so unsure, he is teaching me that I need to remain faithful in missions, the mission that God had called me to. Now, God is showing me that no matter how hard the times may be, that this that he is always with me, that he will never leave me, and that he will never forsake me. That is so encouraging, Christina. I think we are definitely reminded um, that we can trust in God's faithfulness to us and that he He loves us and that this, uh, as you said, this um, pandemic isn't outside of his control. And so since everything is in lockdown and we can't even go, go out beyond our families, um, I wanted to know, do we need to leave our families and South Africa or even our neighborhood to share the good news? Candice, absolutely not. We definitely don't have to go outside, out of our neighborhoods or even our house, in fact. You can be part of God's mission yourself right here where you live, work and play. That is so, that's such good news, Christine. And I know that I will definitely um, do that. Um, yeah, I think it's sometimes I always think that I need to travel overseas to share God's good news, but it doesn't have to be. It can be within my very home and um, to my family. And so Absolutely. everyone, as we come to an end, um, we just want to share kind of an image with you. If you could all just picture dominoes, you know, those small things that stand up next to each other. And if I knock one domino over, it falls onto the next, which falls onto the following, which falls onto the following. And so what we can see by that is that we can share the gospel by just the closest person to us and that's around us. And that is that is just a wonderful thing to know. And also to know that um, by sharing this gospel, uh, it's not out of our own strength. Um, it is God's strength and ability that he gives us to share the gospel. And, and we're not doing it to earn God's favor at all. Um, but we just are filled with this love of Jesus and what he has done for us. And so that like overflows and we want to share it. And with other people. And so 
finally, Christine, as you get ready to go to Japan to be a missionary, how can we, as um, your friends and as your church family, help you to um, go to Japan? Mm, thanks, Candice. You know, being called to God's mission in Japan means that I need to not only leave my home and family behind, but I also need to give up the stability of a full-time job. It is very intimidating, but the missions organization I'm going through needs me to raise 100% of my financial support in pledges before November, before I'm allowed to go next year, February. So I'm currently at 61%, but this, of course, changes with the strength of the RAND. But if God has placed Japan on your heart or anyone else's heart who may be listening, but you yourself cannot go, consider partnering with me. You can pray for Japan. You can pray for me. You can pray that God would mobilize more workers to go out into the mission field. You can invite me to your Bible study or to your cell group or if you buy a video call and allow me to share my story in hopes of finding more partners. Or you could partner with me financially, enabling me to go and bring the good news of Jesus to the Japanese people. Thank you so much, Christine, for sharing. And something that we can do right here and now is to pray for you. And so uh, kids and families out there, if you can just um, bow your heads, close your eyes and pray with me um, as we uh, pray for our friend, Christine. Yeah, dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for Christine. Lord, thank you that you have called her and that you have equipped her and that you've given her a heart after your people in Japan, Lord. Thank you that you have loved her so well and that she is eager to share of your good news, Lord. Thank you that, um, yeah, you are making a way for her to go, Father. And I pray, Lord, that you will just protect her in this time and that you will comfort her, encourage her in um, these uncertain, uncertain, uncertain times. Um, Lord, thank you so much that you care for us and that you love us. Um, in your name, amen. All right, amen. Christine, thank you. Sorry, thank you so much for sharing this with us. I hope everyone enjoyed it and learned as much as I did. Um, that is all for us. And thank you. Back to the studio to answer me. Thank you. Bye. We hope that you are as excited and eager as we are to share the gospel with those around us, where we live, where we go to school, and where we have fun. And finally, we don't have one question of the week. This week, we have questions of the week. We have a missionary family in South Africa, Trish and Nina, and they're going to share with us some questions that they get asked a lot as missionaries. Let's take a look. Sarah Hello, Rosberg Union Church. My name is Trish Baker, and this is my daughter, Nina. Missionary kids live all over the world, and then they visit South Africa every few years. They visit what they call their passport country. That is the country that has given them a passport. So when they come to their passport country, so for us that was South Africa, they get asked a lot of questions. And some of those questions are really, really good questions, and some of them are really not. We lived in Thailand for nine years and then in Singapore for three years. And we would visit South Africa about once every two to three years. Nina, what were some of the really bad questions that you got asked? One of the worst questions for me is when they asked, are you happy to be home? Why was that a bad question? South Africa wasn't really home for me. I lived in Thailand, I was born in Thailand and then I moved to Singapore. So I always struggled to answer that question because I didn't know how to. And are there any other bad questions that you remember? When they asked me if I remember who they were, they would say, oh, uh, I met you when you were two years old in Chiang Mai. Do you remember me? Oh my golly. They would also ask me what it was like in Taiwan. Taiwan? If, if I could speak Taiwanese. How was I supposed to know what Taiwan was like? <laughs> okay, well, never mind the good news. We are here to save the day. We have decided on seven questions that every missionary kid would actually like to be asked and can answer. Question number one. 
What is the funniest thing that has happened to you overseas? Every missionary kid has a funny story to tell, so give them an opportunity to tell it. Nina? I remember when I was younger, I would always run, a, run away from home a lot. Um, when I was four years old, um, I ran away. I ran from away from home and I went to the ice cream shop over across the road from us. Over a few a few minutes later, my mom showed up to fetch me. I had no idea how she knew I was there. But I later discovered that everyone knew who we were and they knew who to call to come and fetch me. All right. Question two. What do you miss most about your host country? Home for missionary kids is the country that they live in, whether that is Singapore or Malaysia or Thailand. So you can't ask them what they miss about South Africa, but you can ask them what they miss about the country that they live in. Nina, what do you miss about Singapore and Thailand? Uh, what I miss about Singapore is when we waited, when we were waiting for my to fetch drunk mainly from school uh, and waiting for my kindergarten to start, uh, we would always go on little dates. You and, and me. You and me on our tete and have tetsurik and kaya toast. And what I miss most about Thailand is riding to school on my dad's big red motorbike. Mm. Question three. Can you describe an average day in your life? In reality, a missionary kid's daily life is not that much different to yours. But this question shows that you're interested in them and want to know more about their lives. Nina, what was a normal average day like for you in Singapore? In Singapore, I would wake up and it was around six o'clock and it was always still dark outside. Um, then I'd get ready for school, get dressed and eat breakfast. And my mom would, and you would walk us down to the bus stop and we would catch the one, two, three bus. And then we would catch the two, seven, three bus um, all the way to school and had a long day at school. Mm -hmm. Came home on the, the same two buses. Uh, finish all my homework, which I had a lot of, and usually have extra Mandarin lessons, and have supper, and normally we would also go walking in the botanical gardens. In the evenings. In the evenings. And in Thailand? In Thailand, I was still in, in kindergarten, but I do remember going to school on my dad's big red, big red motorbike that would take fit all three of us on at the no, same We called it the beast. <laughs> Question four, where is your favorite place in Thailand, Singapore, or whatever country they're living in? This is a great question to ask because you'll find out what they love about the country that they're living in. What was yours? In Thailand, um, I loved going to the hot springs and boiling eggs in the hot springs. Hot springs, yeah. And uh, hiking up to the waterfall and spending the day in the sun. Mm. You play in the river and yeah. Yeah, just enjoy the day. And for Singapore, um, mm. the Sentosa Islands. Sentosa. Sentosa. Um, and my favorite place in, because there was always so much to do, my favorite place in Sentosa was Universal Studios. I'm going on the rides at Universal All Studios. The fun rides. Mm. Question five. Do you think any part of Thailand or Singapore's culture have become part of you? I think something that's become a part of me from Thailand is honouring old people. Um, Thai people loved their grandparents and I remember spending a lot of time with my friends, um, grannies and granddads. Um, most people don't have time for old people. Um, but even in today, I love listening to their stories and taking time. Yeah, that's great. Um, can you think of anything else that you feel like that's you because you lived in Asia, not because you were South African? I think it's using a title when addressing someone and not just calling them by their first name. Especially adults. Yeah, especially mm. adults. It was respectful to have like address someone by their title. So my friend's parents were asking me to call them, I would just call me Leslie. But I, I'll always have to go, I'm see Leslie. Okay. Question six. What have you lost or gained by being a missionary kid? Change is a constant in a missionary kid's life. Uh, we moved houses, um, towns, even countries. And for a, for a child or even an adult, that can feel like loss. But there are also lots of good things too. So ask them about both. Nina, what losses or gains do you think you experienced? 
I think something a, gay, a loss that I experienced mm-hmm. was not learning Afrikaans from an early age, like mm-hmm. most of my friends have. Even today, I still struggle with yeah. speeches. Another thing that I missed out on is getting to know my grandparents mm-hmm. on on a deeper level. That's something that I had to do a lot was say goodbye to all my friends and the community that was around me. And um, leaving Thailand, I had to say goodbye to my pets, Domino and Daisy. So that was also a big loss. Mm. And then not being able to have a pet in Singapore yeah. was also very hard. And gained? Do you think you've gained anything? Um, some One of the biggest things I've gained is all, having experienced all these um, incredible experiences, uh, meeting new people that I never would have met before and traveling to all these incredible places. And finally, question seven. How can I pray for you? People are always very, very interested in what the adults are doing on the mission field and how they can pray for the, for the work and the team and the Thai Buddhists. But when people ask my children, how can we pray for you? They loved it. And it showed that somebody cared about them and not just about their parents and the missionary work. So remember to ask that question next time you meet a missionary kid. We hope that these seven questions have helped you. And next time you meet a missionary kid, you can choose one or seven of them. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us today on Missions Sunday. Please check out the connect card in the notes with some activities and more questions to talk about as a family. And then we just have three announcements. Spark is on Fridays at 5 p.m. on www.org.za. And then we have two devotions on a Tuesday. Tuesday Truth for Kids is on YouTube and on our website on Tuesday mornings. It'll be released at six o'clock. But if you're not awake at six yet, you can watch it later in the day. And then we have a devotion for all our preteens, so grade sixes and sevens on Zoom at five o'clock. If you want the details for that Zoom devotion, please send me or Candice an email or you can check out our Facebook page. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful Sunday, a great week, and we'll see you next week.